This is the second part of a consideration that we started on two weeks ago to look at the times and chronologies of Ezra, Nehemiah and Esther. So some brief revision. We remind ourselves that the books of Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Haggai, Zechariah and Malachi and along with parts of the prophecy of Daniel have in common the fact that they were given at the time of the ascendancy of the Medo-Persian Empire. And we covered quite a bit of material which, firstly, we noted that the time of Cyrus, that he had given the decree to restore the temple, that there had been opposition from the locals up until the time of Darius. Um, Darius Hystaspes, who was the third great Persian king. And then, um, then in the second year of Darius, we have the prophecies of Haggai and Zechariah. Firstly, Haggai's prophecy was to stir up God's people to get on with building the temple and Zechariah reassured them of God's overshadowing care. And we finished up last time with the challenges in determining who were the kings labelled Ahasuerus and Artaxerxes in Ezra 4 verses 6 and 7. And so just to refresh our memory, uh, I'd like us to turn to Ezra 4 verses 6 and 7. Ezra 4, verses 6 and 7. Now, uh, actually, we might pick up the reading at verse 5, that the people, or verse 4 even, the people of the land tried to discourage the people of Judah. They, verse 5, they hired counsellors against them to frustrate their purpose all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. So that's the... That's the scope of the time setting. And why pick on Cyrus and Darius? Because, as we mentioned before, Cyrus had issued the decree and Darius confirmed that decree, as we read later on in Ezra 5 and 6. Now then, verses 6 and 7. Now, in the reign of Ahasuerus, in the beginning of his reign, they wrote an accusation against inhabitants of Judah and Jerusalem. And then in verse 7, in the days of Artaxerxes also, Bishlam, Mithradath, Tabil, and the rest of their companions wrote to Artaxerxes, king of Persia, and so on and so forth. Now, we explored last time who were these Ahasuerus and Artaxerxes, and we pointed out that there are two streams of thought that Cyrus we know about and Darius we know about, we're reasonably competent who those kings are. They are respectively the first king of the Medo-Persian Empire and then the fourth king, Darius Hystaspes, also called Darius the Great. And therefore there is some thought as um, that Ahasuerus is an alternate name for Cambyses and Artaxerxes is a, is a person by the name of Gaumata. And, um, and the argument was that they would be very interested in not having a hostile Jewish presence. And so we explored some of those and the, the likely conclusion we came up with was that Cambyses was the one who ordered the work to be halted and Gaumata might well have confirmed that, but he also only reigned a few months and so would have had no real time to form an opinion one way or another. Whatever the case, the work on the temple halted for some significant time. 
And so that would lend support to the fact that Cambyses was the, was the king who ordered a halt to the work. Uh, Cambyses had somewhat of a reputation of being irreligious as opposed to his father Cyrus who ordered the, the restoration of the Jewish temple. Now, the point we made last time and where we're finished is that the names in Ezra 4 are in fact proper names and not throne names. So the argument goes something like this. In Persepolis, which was the ceremonial capital of the Persian Empire, there is a door jam of a palace built late in the reign of Darius I. And on that door jam is an inscription, I am Darius, the great king of kings, king of countries containing all kinds of men, king in this great earth, far and wide, son of Hystaspes and Achaemenes. There is also another inscription, I am Xerxes, the great king. Obviously, there was a formula to repeat, just so that you recognised who they were. Uh, king of containing all kinds of men, and it concludes, son of King Darius, an Achaemenian. Okay, so the argument goes that Xerxes is a proper name, and Darius likewise is a proper name, and we're probably not disputing that. But then there are these inscriptions on, on a place called Gandish Neme, descriptions, parallel inscriptions that talk about Darius and Xerxes, given about the same time. Um, and so where we're going with all this is that the names in Ezra chapter 4 in the reign of Ahasuerus is actually referring to Xerxes, the son of Darius, and in the days of Artaxerxes actually refers to the son of Xerxes who ascended the throne after him. And so this raises the question, well, if that's the case, what is the author trying to do? The author would appear to be saying that despite the initial ruling of Cyrus, reconfirmed by Darius, that the inhabitants of the land weren't going to give up very easily and they kept making repeated trouble. Now, there's some support for that, because if we have a look now at Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter 1. Nehemiah chapter 1, and we pick up the reading at verse 2. Hannah and I, one of my brethren, came with men from Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped, who had survived the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the survivors who were left from the captivity in the province <clears throat> are there in great distress and reproach. The walls of Jerusalem is also broken down and its gates are burned with fire. And in the standard chronology of things, we're talking of well over a 100 years since the first return under Zerubbabel. So the author might, the, the writer to Ezra or the compiler of Ezra might well have been seeking to talk about the problems that the Jews faced repeatedly. Okay, now <clears throat> there's another inscription from Persepolis. Uh, we've got it there for you. It's quite a lengthy inscription, but this one is from Artaxerxes. And the second point there I am Artaxerxes, the great king, king of kings, king of countries or you know, repeating the same formula as Darius and Xerxes. And he says, he's the son of King Xerxes, the grandson of Darius the Achaemenian, and so forth. So where does this actually get us? If we accept that Ahasuerus and Artaxerxes are in fact proper names of later kings, 
then the reference to the later kings in the middle of the story from Cyrus and Darius is to portray a picture of continuing hostility. Now, of course, added to that is the fact that we have Haman's evil plot in Esther, which, <clears throat> which um, also is a bit of a problem as well. Now, that's one line of argument, that these are proper names and not alternate names. It does seem to me that there are three passages of scripture which make this a problem. And the first passage is in Ezra 4, chapter 4, verses 23 to 24. Now, um, let's remember that, first of all, if, if Artaxerxes is the grandson of Darius, then in his reign... Rehum the commander and Shimshai the scribe, verse 9, wrote this letter. And then in verses 23 and 24, when the copy of King Artaxerxes' letter was read before Rehum, Shimshai the scribe and their companions, they went in haste to Jerusalem against the Jews and by force of arms made them cease to do the temple work. The work of the house of God, which is at Jerusalem, ceased and it was discontinued until the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. So you've got this problem that in the text, it's saying that Rehum and Shimshai and their companions were the ones who forced the halt to the building of the temple in the reign of Darius. Now that's one line of argument. But I now want to take you to another line of argument. For that, can we please have a look at Daniel chapter 5? Daniel chapter 5. Now, Daniel chapter 5 is a chapter that tells about the time of Belshazzar's feast, the writing on the wall. Daniel interprets the writing, uh, says that your kingdom's been divided, verse 28 and given to the Medes and the Persians. Verse 30 and 31, Daniel 5, verse 30 and 31 tells us that that very night Belshazzar, king of the Chaldeans, was slain, and Darius the Mede received the kingdom, being about 62 years old. Now notice this point. Darius the Mede received the kingdom. He didn't conquer the kingdom. He received it. Why is that important? Come to Daniel chapter 9 and verse 1. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the lineage of the Medes, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. Daniel 5 verses 13 and 31 and Daniel 9 verse 1 is talking about the same person. His name is Darius. Question. Who was this Darius? It was a regal name, an alternative name given to him. History shows that the ruler of Babylon was a chappy by the name of Gobrias. He was a Mede. And this matches perfectly with what Daniel has to say. So what does that tell us? It tells us that Gobrias assumed the name of Darius and his father assumed the name of Ahasuerus. In other words, they were throne names or royal names given to them, supplementary to their names. We talk about Darius and we call him Darius Hystaspes to indicate that he, to, to distinguish him from other kings by the name of Darius. So it would appear that the names Ahasuerus and Artaxerxes in Ezra 4 are not proper names after all. They are, for want of a better term, throne names or names given to them to designate their um, senior position. So 
So uh, that's the information as best as we can ascertain it. Let's move on from that now. So we now come to consider who the Artaxerxes is in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. Both books talk about Artaxerxes. Now, this is not the Artaxerxes of Ezra chapter 4, just to confuse us even more. This is the Artaxerxes referenced in Ezra chapter 6. And I'll just turn that quote up. Ezra chapter 6 and... Sorry, make that Ezra chapter 7. Now, Ezra chapter 7 verse 1 says, Now, after these things, in the reign of Artaxerxes, king of Persia, Ezra the son of Sarariah, the son of Azariah, and on and on and on, went up to Jerusalem. And verse 7 tells us he went in the seventh year of king Artaxerxes. Now, throughout Ezra chapter 7, we're told that the king and the counsellor offered gifts, Ezra chapter 7, verse 15, and he was, Ezra was also directed to acquire offerings as needed in verse 17. There were vessels for the temple service made available. These are vessels additional to the ones that Cyrus handed back and that Ezra could call on the king's treasury to finance additional funds as needed and also could ask for the redirection of the king's revenue that he would normally get. Now, again, in Ezra chapter 7 and verse 27, we have to understand what is the aim of Ezra's mission. Verse 27 of Ezra 7. Blessed be the Lord God of our fathers who has put such a thing as this in the king's heart to beautify the house of the Lord which is in Jerusalem. Now, note carefully, it is not to reconstruct the city of Jerusalem or to fortify it, nor is it to construct the temple. That's already happened in the reign of Cyrus and Darius. This is to beautify. This is to extra embellish the house of the Lord in verse 27. And so we're told that Ezra arrived in Jerusalem in the seventh year of the reign of King Artaxerxes. So that's Ezra and he's beginning his service in the seventh year of Artaxerxes. So now, what about the Artaxerxes we read in Nehemiah? So if we come to, well, we've actually read Nehemiah chapter 1. Let's refresh our memory. Uh, Nehemiah chapter 1 and verse 1, the word of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah, it came to pass in the month of Chislu in the 20th year. The 20th year of what? Chapter 2, verse 1. It came to pass in the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was before him, that I took the wine and so forth. So Nehemiah's request, and what is it that the king Nehemiah asks for? It's to rebuild the city. Verse 5 of Nehemiah chapter 2. Nehemiah says... If it please the king and if your servant has found favour in your sight, I ask that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's tombs, that I may rebuild it. Incidentally, in particularly in Medo-Persia, it was considered sacrilege to neglect the tombs of your ancestors. And therefore, the king would have found Nehemiah's request perfectly reasonable. Perfectly reasonable. Incidentally, uh, just an allusion in verse 6. The king said to me, the queen also sitting beside him, is very likely the queen mother. That is to say, Esther. But we'll come to Esther a bit later on. Now, Nehemiah's request, as we pointed out, 
was in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, and his request was to rebuild the city and restore the gates. And we've got a whole pile of quotations there in support of that. And once again, at a time of great trouble for the Jews. Now, we get some help from an independent source. Can we now come to Daniel chapter 9, please? Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9 introduces us to the 70-week prophecy. And we had some discussion of the 70-week prophecy in our um, study weekend just over a week ago. Now, Daniel chapter 9 and picking up the reading at verse 24. 70 weeks are determined for your people, for your holy city, and so forth. Verse 25. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublesome times. Now note that, in troublesome times. And we note from Nehemiah's account of restoring the wall and the gates of Jerusalem that it was very troublesome. So Daniel chapter 9 to some extent helps us with setting the time of of. Um, the king whose reign, under whose reign Nehemiah um, restored the gates of and the walls of Jerusalem. So with that scriptural analysis then, we come to consider who that king might be. Now, Artaxerxes reigned at least 32 years. We learn that from Ch Nehemiah chapter 13 and verse 6. So if we have a look at the various reigns of the Persian kings, we find that Darius Hystaspes reigned for 36 years, Xerxes, his son, reigned for 20 years, Artaxerxes, his, Darius's grandson, reigned for 40 years. The next two kings had very short reigns indeed, one called Xerxes II, one called Sogdianus. Then there was a Darius II, also known as Nothus, and he reigned for 19 years. And then there was an Artaxerxes II, who reigned for 46 years. And then Artaxerxes III reigned for 20 years. And then five years later came the conquest of Alexander the Great. Now, of the kings who lived or who reigned for 32 years, we find that only Darius Hystaspes, Artaxerxes I, and Artaxerxes II are the only kings who qualify. Those three kings. So that narrows down our search. Well then, who is the Artaxerxes of Ezra and Nehemiah? Is it Darius Hystaspes? He was clearly favourable for Jewish worship, as we learn from Ezra 4, verse 24, through to 6, verse 15. There is a link with Queen Esther's coronation and Ezra's return, both of which occurred in the seventh year of King Artaxerxes. So, if Artaxerxes is a throne name and Darius is a throne name, then Darius Hystaspes could be a candidate. Now, we think there's a problem with that for this reason. The 20th year of Darius is 501 BC, which is too early for the starting date of the 70-week prophecy. That's point number one. Point number two, the focus on the building in Jerusalem was the temple. Daniel 9 particularly says the walls will be rebuilt. 
in troublous times. Well, certainly the building of the temple was in troublous times, but Daniel 9 said the wall would be built in troublous times. All right. So we submit that Darius is not the king referred to. What about Artaxerxes I then? His 20th year at 444 BC puts him within the scope of the 70-week prophecy to rebuild Jerusalem's walls. There is, unfortunately, no record to, confer, to substantiate that Artaxerxes I had a favourable attitude toward the Jews. We learn that only from scripture. And we, he is therefore the best fit for that. Okay, what about Artaxerxes II? He reigned for 46 years. His 20th year, being 384 BC, is far too late for the start of the 70-week prophecy. So we therefore conclude that Artaxerxes I, who reigned from 464 to 424 BC, is the best candidate for the Artaxerxes of both Ezra and Nehemiah. Now we want to come back to think about Queen Esther and King Ahasuerus. That's a picture by Edwin Long, Queen Esther ready for her coronation as he imagined it. We just drop that in for a bit of visual distraction. So now, we come to consider who is the Ahasuerus in the book of Esther. Is he the Ahasuerus and Ezra 4, for example, will we submit that that is not the case? Now, I'm going to turn up then Esther chapter 1, and I'm going to read a, a bit of Ezra chapter 1. I said Ezra, I meant Esther. Sorry about that. Esther chapter 1. And I want us to note very carefully what it says about King Ahasuerus and what we learn. So, Esther chapter 1. It came to pass in the days of Ahasuerus. This was the Ahasuerus who reigned from India to Ethiopia over 127 provinces. In those days when King Ahasuerus sat on the throne of his kingdom, which was in Shush and the citadel, that in the third year of his reign he made a feast for all his officials and servants, the powers of Persia and Media, and on and on and on it goes. Uh, let me skip a few verses. Um, yeah, let's just pause that and let's come back to Ezra, Esther chapter 8 and verse 9. Now, Esther chapter 8 and verse 9, the king's scribes were called at that time in the third month, on the 23rd day, was written according to all that Mordecai commanded uh, to the Jews, the satraps and so forth. And notice again, the princes of the provinces from India to Ethiopia, 127 provinces in all to every province. So two passages in Esther emphasise, one, that King Ahasuerus reigned from India to Ethiopia and two, 127 provinces. I'm going to skip the second line of argument and concentrate on India to Ethiopia. Now, first of all, Darius Hystaspes reigned from 521 to 485, and he is the first king who actually ruled over part of India. Maybe he's the king. Now, I want us to notice this. Es Esther 1, verses, th verses 3 onwards. In the third year of his reign, the reign of Ahasuerus, he made a feast for all his officials, 
Verse 4, when he showed the riches of his glorious kingdom and the splendour of his excellent majesty for many days, 180 days in all. And then verse 5, the king made a feast lasting seven days for all the people present in Shushan the citadel from great to small. And then in verse 6, there were white and blue linen curtains with cords of fine linen. Now, by any standards, this is sumptuous. This is really sumptuous. Okay, so we have then these descriptions of the magnificence of the kingdom of Ahasuerus mentioned there. So, is Darius the Ahasuerus mentioned in the book of Esther? He was favourably disposed towards the Jews, as we've already said. So it would not be surprising that he would gravitate to Esther, a Jewess, for his queen, although Esther was told not to disclose her Jewish heritage. There's a problem with that. For the first two years of Darius's reign... He spent his time in quashing rebellions. He had no time to plan a great party. As a matter of fact, when Darius ascended the throne, he found if, if, if you had voting taking place throughout his kingdom, there would be two choices on the ballot paper, Darius or anyone but Darius. Nobody voted for Darius. And Darius had to spend a lot of time quelling rebellions all over the place. It looks like his subjects didn't want him at all. But there you go, Darius being a man not to be trifled with, he crushed the rebellions and so he established his kingdom. Now, secondly... Up to this point in time, the collection of taxes in the Medo-Persian Empire had been somewhat haphazard and perhaps not terribly consistent. One of the things that Darius did was to reorganise the methods of taxation and that caused a great deal of resentment. I want to read to you now a quotation from the historian's history of the world on pages 608, 609, volume 2. This administrative reform did not please the Persians and they tried to pay off their enforced obedience by scoffing jests at the king's expense. Cyrus, they said, had been a father and Cambyses a master. But Darius was only an innkeeper greedy of gain. For the division of the empire was done less for a political object than for financial profits. The other provinces were taxed according to their extent and wealth, with a tribute payable partly in kind, that is, sheep, goats, rams, wheat, barley, whatever, and partly in money. Now, we are informed that the revenue in money went up to nearly £28 million sterling. Now, just before we sort of say, hmm, that's a fair bit of money, let's remember that this account was published in 1908. When we access a website to take into account the rates of inflation, we discover that £28 million sterling in 1908 today would amount to £253 trillion sterling. And in Australian dollars, that is five... Sorry, I said £253 billion sterling. Australian dollars, that's... $501.3 $501.3 billion. Now, that was the annual revenue, and assuming that it operated from 515 BC to 490, when Xerxes ascended the throne, he was theoretically in possession of a treasury 
amounting to Australian $12.533 trillion. Now, just in case we're getting a bit, a bit muddled with billions and trillions, Australia's total GDP for 2019 was estimated at 2.23 trillion. So Xerxes was sitting on a treasure amounting to six times Australia's total gross domestic product for 2019. Xerxes is the first king to be able to have an opulent party who was sitting on a substantial treasury. Now, even more importantly, when Darius ascended the throne, he was challenged for that throne. Not only did he have revolts from the provinces, but others challenged the throne. What was remarkable... What was remarkable was that his son Xerxes ascended the throne unchallenged. And that was thought to be to the very formidable influence of Atossa, the wife of Darius, the daughter of Cyrus. There is a relief of Xerxes the Great. Now, as we said, Xerxes is the first king not to spend the early part of his reign quelling revolts. And he inherited a substantial treasury. Now, we've come at this from indirect history. Let's have a look now at Daniel chapter 11. Daniel chapter 11. Also in the first year of Darius the Mede, Daniel 11 verse 1, I even I stood up to confirm and strengthen him. And now I will tell you the truth. Behold, three more kings will arise in Persia, and the fourth shall be far richer than them all. Note the point. Not just rich, not just richer, but far richer. That fits perfectly. From the time of Darius the Mede, who reigned with Cyrus the Persian, the three kings who would stand up in Persia were Cambyses, Galmata, and then Darius Hystaspes. And the fourth, who was far richer than them all, was Darius' son Xerxes. He was indeed sitting on a treasure. Now, another feature in the story of the book of Esther. We learn in, we might try and find it, um, in Esther chapter 2, And verse 2, the king's servants who attended him said, let beautiful young virgins be sought for the king. Let the king appoint officers in all the provinces and so forth and so forth. Verse 4, then let the young woman who pleases the king be queen instead of Vashti. This thing pleased the king and so he did. Now, this story is not as improbable as it might seem. If the king commanded young virgins to come to him, then you probably had no choice to obey. However, the story is plausible for this reason. Xerxes ascended the throne at age 35, and the historian's history of the world tells us that he was the handsomest man of his time. But there's another feature that accords perfectly with the story of Esther. Xerxes was noted for being indolent and weak of character. How does that play out? Well, let's come back to Ezra chapter 1. Ezra chapter 1, verse 10. On the seventh day, when the heart of the king was merry with wine, he commanded Mehuman, Bizar, etc., 
verse 11, to bring Queen Vashti before the king wearing her royal crown in order to show her beauty to the people and to the officials. But Queen Vashti, verse 12, refused to come at the king's command. Queen Vashti refused to come. Now, Vashti would never, ever dare to do that if she was queen to either Cyrus or Darius. She would never dare do that. But because Xerxes was indolent and weak of character, she thought she could get away with it. Well, I suppose in a sense she did get away with it in that she didn't get her head chopped off. So, in conclusion, then, we say that Xerxes is the King Ahasuerus mentioned in the book of Esther. What scripture has to say about his reign, about the splendour of his reign, fits the prophecy of Daniel chapter 11 and fits what is known about them. Now then, what is a conclusion that we want to bring to this? We've considered the times of Ezra, Nehemiah and Esther and essentially there were times when there was not the visible hand of God, not in the same way as Moses bringing Israel out of Egypt or Joshua bringing Israel across the Jordan in the time of flood. God was working but his working was behind the scenes. And through seeming natural processes, God overshadowed the lives of his people, delivering them out of danger, and indeed, in the time of Queen Esther, out of annihilation. And the encouragement we can take is this, that he will do much more for us the spiritual seed of Abraham. Thank you.